guys, in this video I'm going to discuss why most pure racing cars have adopted a mid-engine layout. Whereas up till the, uh, the late 1950s, most of, most of the racing cars were front engines like this one here. So what changed? Well, the old paradigm was to have cars with good directional stability at high speeds. And to achieve this, you need a high polar moment of inertia. What does that mean? Well, what you need is sort of what they call a dumbbell effect. A dumbbell looks something like that. And with a dumbbell, you've got like your big masses at either end and a light bar in between. And exactly this is the way that car was, or this type of car. You had the heavy engine on one end with transmission, and on the other end you had the fuel tank, the heavy fuel tank. So basically, if you look at it, it really resembles a dumbbell. And uh, here, I got a... A simplified application of uh, a simplified version of an application I once did for a client and you can see here now uh, the front these are the wheels wheelbase here and you got like the engine transmission drive shaft driver and fuel tank and you can see here that the heavy masses are at each end and you can see the weight distribution basically front to rear is basically nearly identical 57% to 43% now it's basically near to 50 percent and um, if, if I want to know where the center of gravity of that car is well the, the, the center of gravities of the various components are here and if I want to know the center of gravity of the whole car basically what you do is like uh, let me just sketch it here let's do a simplified version let's say you got like two parts there's a center of gravity one part, and there's a center of gravity of the second part. And you want to know where's the, where's the center of gravity of that composite thing? Well, pick a reference point, let's say here. Okay? And what you do is like, you take, this is M1, first mass. This is M2. And this is this is uh, P1, the first the center of gravity. This is P2. Or P, P1 is basically the distance from that point P1 to here. And P2 is basically that distance. So basically, you, you, to find the center of gravity is basically M1 times P1 plus M2 dot P2, the, the distance to the second point, and then you divide that all by the combined mass, basically M1 plus M2. And what you get is the distance. You got a number here, which is P3, and that P3 is going to be the distance from your reference point till that center of gravity of the whole car. And if we go back to our application, uh, is that exactly the formula we used here. And if I, the center of gravity of the car is then here, right here in the middle, which you would expect because like you got the main masses on this side and on this side. So basically center of gravity is in the middle and that's why you got this um, nearly 50-50 weight distribution over the two uh, of the two axes of the of two front uh, uh, wheels uh, four wheels uh, two uh, wheel axes i mean right now the the main thing with these cars those the main thing with that dumbbell effect that i mentioned earlier is that cars with a with a with a high moment of inertia or high polar moment of inertia, they are very sluggish to change. So basically, um, they're, they've got high directional stability, which means like this car, I mean, if you look at a car at the, uh, at the above, let's say this is now our car with the wheels. Oh, sorry, let me, let me do that wheel better. Ah. Now, that's much better. So, and here's another wheel, wheel, and wheel. So basically, uh, a car like, which is like a dumbbell with both masses, uh, with ma with the, the heavy masses at either end, it is, it's got excellent directional stability in the straight line, but turns it doesn't like. And it needs a lot of effort to, to, to make it turn. But once it turns, it's very difficult to stop it. It's basically like, uh, yeah, let's take a roundabout. If you got a roundabout and you got like four heavy people 
sitting on that roundabout. And you want to turn that, I'm sorry. And you want to turn that roundabout. It is going to be very difficult to turn it because of those heavy people. But once it turns, it is very, it's going to be very difficult to stop it. This is the this is the problem with with uh, with shapes of high polar moment of inertia. They are they do not like change. So if they're stationary, it takes a lot of effort to move them. And once they're moving, it's like a lot. It takes a lot of effort to stop them. And exactly that's the problem with those front engine cars. They were very sluggish in turns. So basically, what what a lot of drivers used to do back then is when you have a turn, when when you have a turn like this, or let me let me do it here. If you have a turn, let's say this is this is a turn right now, and here's my car. So obviously, to handle the turn, they would turn the front wheels. But <clears throat> because those cars tend to understeer, that wasn't enough. so. What they used to do, they used to have the back end lose. Gr so basically. They used to go in a drift where basically they, they turn the front wheels and at the same time break traction of the of the rear uh, wheels. So basically the car at the back end is sliding out and at the front end is basically turning in. So basically to help that sluggish front end, they, they would break traction of the of the rear wheels and have the have the have the back end slide out and at the same time the front end is turning in because of those front uh, turned in front wheels and this is called drifting and that's what they used to do back then in order to compensate for that understeer those cars used to have right and another thing another thing about about those uh, front engine cars if we go back to our model <coughs> let me just remove the various center gravities so this is my center of gravity at the start of the race. Start of race means I have a full fuel tank. Now let me go mid-race and let's show my... You see now my center of gravity moved forward because that fuel tank got lower, uh, sorry, lighter. Uh, let's wait here, so more mass on this side. And at the end of the race, and you see, look at the weight distribution now. It used to be, it used to be 57. Mid-race, it is now 50 and at race end, it is now 40 and let me uh, show my car CG now look at my car CG at race end it's basically right here so it's traveled all this distance during the race which means now my uh, my rear wheels have only 40 percent of the mass on them so they're basically providing less traction under acceleration because they got less weight weight on them or mass on them. and during braking because they've got less mass on them they provide less assistance for the front brakes so basically at race end or or even at, at mid race they are the the front wheels are taking 50 percent of uh, are doing a lot of uh, under braking they're having a heavy load because the rear wheels only got like 50% of the weight. And if we go further to the end, they have like got 60% of the weight on them. So basically the front wheels are, 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 are suffering heavily under braking because the rears aren't assisting that much. And the rears aren't assisting either under, under acceleration because they're providing less traction. So you can see the various problems with those front engine cars. Now let's go mid-engine. Let me remove my CGs. Let's go mid-engine. Let me let me first do it. Put it at start, and you can see here the polar moment of inertia of a front-engine car is ten, right? Basically, it's basically calculating the moment of inertia of each of the components and then adding it to, together. You get like ten. Now, if you go mid-engine, and you can see here mid-engine means the engine has been moved back, the fuel tank forward, the driver in front, and, with, and and you have like basically the fuel tank is basically behind you and around you as a driver. Here's the engine and here's the transmission. And you can see now if I show 
the core CG. It's right here. And you can see the masses, the main masses, basically engine and fuel tank, they're really compact around that CG, CG vis a vis the old uh, uh, layout, which basically had the masses out there way away from that center of gravity. See, that's, that's the difference with the mid engine layout. And you can see now with the mid engine layout, the weight distribution is 71% on the rears, which basically gives them excellent traction at race start. Let me go middle. Take some time to calculate. It's now 70, uh, sorry, middle. It's now 76. And end is now 81. So you can see with progression, with race progression, the rear wheels are getting more percent of that uh, mass, so they're providing better, you know, better traction in the front engine cars and definitely better brake assistance for, uh, for the front tires, for the front wheels. And if you look at that race end, let me just show the car CG. So you can see the car CG traveled this shorter distance than the front engine car because of the fuel tanks getting emptier and emptier. And still the CG is, it's still within that range here where all the masses are concentrated so basically the cg is traveling towards the rear tires giving the rear tires because they are driven they are the guys the rear the rear tires are the the, the tires or the wheels which are powering the car so basically the center gravity as the race progresses center gravity is traveling towards the rear wheels basically not enhancing but keeping their tractive and braking capabilities Remember, it's now 81% of the, of the car's mass, but also remember the car's mass is also lower because now we basically practically have no fuel in the car. So, and if we compare now, the mid-engine's polar moment of inertia is, look at that, uh, 2.5 to 3, that's at race end. Let's go to start. It's 4.5 to 10.6. So that's like an enormous difference. And exactly this is what is the main advantage of a mid-engine layout. This car has got a lower total moment of inertia. It's basically the reverse of a dumbbell. I mean, I drew a dumbbell here. And a mid-engine car, a mid-engine car is basically, if I have the barbell, uh, the dumbbell bar here, and a mid-engine car is something like that, where I have my plates here like that, okay? So the, dumbbell, the front engine car was like a typical dumbbell, masses out here. The mid-engine car is, you'd have the plates in here, in the bore itself. And this thing is much more nimble to turn and change direction. And if we take the roundabout example, it would be a roundabout where you would have your people sitting here. And this, you would have to admit, is easier to change, to turn and to stop than this one here and this is the basic the basic biggest single advantage of uh, mid-engine cars because these shapes here these shapes here this one and this one have got way less polar moment of inertia than this shape or this shape and this is this is proven here by those numbers so this is the single biggest advantage of of mid-engine car and basically the paradigm basically the paradigm of of uh, of of um, of, of mid-engine car is basically they said you know what direction stability I don't care about that we want road holding we want grip and to get grip they placed a bigger weight percentage on those rear tires by placing the engine behind the driver within within the wheelbase because a mid-engine car is basically where you have the engine within the wheelbase if you have the engine way back here it's then a rear engine car okay so and you've got like further advantages of, of a mid-engine car are first of all other than the polar moment of inertia which is the basically the big one other advantages are better acceleration and braking and that's obvious here i explained that that's because of this higher uh, percentage of weight on the rear tires you got better acceleration better braking uh, you got less weight because let me just remove the center gravities in the front engine, I have this drive shaft. In the rear, in, sorry, in the mid engine, I don't need it, so I save that weight. So I've got less weight. 
in mid engine also compared to the front engine the driver I've got to put the driver somehow I've got to put the driver out of the way of the drive shaft so either I raise the driver higher up or I put him somewhere out of the way of the drive shaft with the mid engine I don't have this uh, problem so I can put my driver lower makes the car lower so what's the advantage of a, of a lower car? Well, a lower car handles better. I'll show you also why. Uh, let me make some space. Uh, a car. And the, the suspension geometry of a car determines your what, what's called your roll center or your roll line. And let's say our roll line is this. And let's say your center of gravity is over here. Now, the car is gonna this is the, this is the distance between your center of gravity and roll line your car is gonna roll if you look at the front of the car your car in turns your car is gonna roll either this way or that way and obviously the higher that you your center of gravity is from that roll line the more it's gonna roll during turns and that's why a lower car is much more beneficial in turns, not only in turns, but also when accelerating and braking, you have less mass transfer to front and rear. I mean, obviously, here is way less than here, okay? So basically, lowering the car gives you that advantage as well. And um, that, that's, that's one further advantage. Then obviously, a lower car, a lower car, not only uh, in terms of handling is better, but also it, it's aerodynamically better because now your car is pu punching a smaller hole in the air than with the driver sitting up here. Remember, it's not only the driver up here, but the whole you know cockpit and, and bodywork and stuff like that can be lowered and basically is punching a smaller hole in the in the air. Now, another thing I can mention is. Ferrari in the from 75 till uh, 1980 they had their car in their F1 car the 312 T series and what they did they adopted the transverse gear gearbox or transmission what that means is that let me just sketch it here before showing it on the model or showing its effects on the model basically normally you would have like let's say that's your the back end of your car here are your rear rear wheels and basically a normal transmission is something like that okay there's your normal transmission and then there's your engine let's say okay this is a longitudinal transmission and what Ferrari did back then that's why they were called they were called 312 T 312 312 T well the 3 is 3 liters 12 cylinders and the T is for transverse gearbox and I think in Italian it's transfer, transfer, transfer sale or something like that. So basically what they did, instead of that longitudinal gearbox, now the gearbox was transverse, was turned by 90 degrees. What that meant, it moved uh, the center of gravity of that gearbox closer to the car center of gravity. We can see it here in the model. If I show my center of gravity, that's the car, and now you see here, there's the, there's the gearbox, and now turning it by 90 degrees moves that center of gravity of the gearbox from somewhere around here to here, closer to that, to that uh, car center of gravity. This reduces the polar moment of inertia. I mean, let's compare. 4.5, transverse, 3.9. So that makes the car more nimble in turns. It handles better, makes it more nervous though. So you basically need a good driver to be able to cope with that. And they had back then Nicky Lauda. And uh, so, so basically that was the principle behind it. Re if reduce further that uh, polar moment of inertia by uh, putting that gearbox in tran tr uh, putting at uh, putting that gearbox or turning that transmission by ninety degrees and making it transverse. Right. And uh, the the main the main reason was that that um, to reduce that polar moment of inertia. However, that idea was pretty cool until until uh, 1979 when when aerodynamics because of that low to 79 and ground effects aerodynamics played a bigger role than mechanical advantages. And you needed that space here, that space here, and here. 
you needed that for aerodynamics and that's why the transverse gearbox was not attractive anymore and actually today I, I, as far as I know nobody's using transverse gearboxes because they swallow up too much width of that car and you need that width for your aerodynamics because aerodynamics today are the most important factor in, in racing cars more so than in the past right and another case I wanted to mention before I finish is basically in 2015 Nissan came up with their GTR limo car which was mid-engine but it had the engine in front of the driver so basically you can imagine the Nissan layout just by reversing that picture so basically this is now in with the Nissan model this is the front end and this is the rear end and you have this weight distribution the engine is mid-engine because it's within the wheelbase but it is in front of the driver and here the the concept was first of all it was an error it was the reasoning behind it was for aerodynamic reasons primarily because uh, putting the front the the engine in front of the driver gave uh, gave the car a long bonnet which produced uh, uh, much more downforce and because the car that GTR uh, was or is front engine uh, sorry front wheel drive uh, having the, the engine up front would aid weight distribution uh, for the front wheels I don't know what the weight distribution is I'm sure it's not 71% but basically that was the point behind it right and uh, uh, having that uh, enhanced weight distribution on the front tires uh, allowed them to reduce the size of the rear tires and thus also the drag of the whole car now it's interesting to see how that concept develops in uh, in, in 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 the future having the still a mid-engine car but having the engine in front of the driver